This video is going to introduce the formation and reactivity of enols and enolates as part of the carbonyl chemistry section of our second year organic chemistry module. So carbonyl functional groups are typically electrophilic. Their LUMO is usually the pi star antibonding orbital, which is polarized in this direction. Um, it's delta positive at carbon and delta negative at oxygen, just because oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So if we were to expose a typical carbonyl compound to a nucleophile, it would attack at carbon, forming a new sigma bond there, and that would break the pi bond because we're filling the pi star antibonding orbital and kick the electrons up onto oxygen. And we end up with a tetrahedral intermediate like this. Now, carbonyl compounds can be converted into both their enols and enolates, um, which are essentially related compounds. It's just that one is a deprotonated form of the other. So here you can see in the enol, it's got an OH group, and in the enolate, it's O minus because it's been deprotonated. Now, if we look at the resonance forms of these compounds, both involve the lone pair on oxygen. So if we push the lone pair on oxygen down and then push it through this uh, adjacent pi bond um, by resonance, then the resonance form of this compound looks like this. This is the enol, uh, enol's resonance form. And if we do the same with the enolate, we can end up with an analogous compound here, which again is just lacking a proton. Now, what you'll notice about both of these compounds is that they are nucleophilic at the alpha carbon. They've got a formal negative charge, an anion, on the alpha carbon, which is the one adjacent to where the carbonyl was originally. So we've taken our carbonyl compound, which is electrophilic, and we've converted them into something which is now nucleophilic. So we can do a range of different reactions with these enols and enolates. So if we expose these enols and enolates to an electrophile, then we can use these as nucleophile to form a new bond to something that's now electrophilic. So whereas our parent carbonyl compound will react with nucleophiles to form new bonds at the carbonyl carbon, uh, we can convert our carbonyl compound into an enol or an enolate, and it will then react with electrophiles to form new bonds at the alpha carbon. So how do we form enols and enolates? Well, starting with enolates, and this process is called enolization, we treat our carbonyl compound with a base. And depending on the nature of the carbonyl compound that you're using and the strength of the base that you're using, this could either be a reversible reaction or an irreversible reaction. And I've done a video on pKa and pKa-H in organic chemistry, which should allow you to predict what's going to happen there. The other thing that we need is a proton on the alpha position. So the position that's immediately adjacent to the carbonyl needs to have protons on it. If there are no protons, we can't enolize at that position. So the base removes the proton and we kick the electrons all the way up onto the uh, oxygen atom. And that gives us this resonance form of our enolate. And this is typically the one that we draw because it's the most stable with the negative charge on oxygen rather than carbon. So what about forming enols? Well, this is now keto-enol tautomerization. So um, we can refer to our parent carbonyl compound as being in the keto form in this, uh, in this instance. And we can promote keto-enol tautomerization by treating it with a strong acid. So we can protonate the carbonyl, which gets us through to this protonated carbonyl species. And we can then basically do the same as what's happening above, just using the conjugate base of the acid that we were using, uh, which now removes the alpha proton and we end up with our enol form here. Now, the thing to note about keto enol tautomerization is that it's always reversible. So with enolization, you've got the possibility of forming an enolate irreversibly, but if you're forming an enol, it always happens with uh, some degree of equilibria involved. Now, let's look at how enols and enolates react. Uh, they're essentially the same, it's just that you're doing it under basic or acidic conditions respectively. So I'm going to treat both of these, both this enol, enolate and this enol, with an electrophile. Um, I've just drawn a, a, a biatomic um, electrophile. Um, we'll see why in a moment. So they can be a, a nucleophilic at oxygen, but mainly the reactions that we're interested in are where they're nucleophilic at carbon. So we're going to push the electrons from this oxygen lone pair down, and we're going to attack the electrophile. Uh, and break the bond in the electrophile like that. And that's going to functionalize our enolate at the alpha position. And that's the end of the reaction for enolates. That's as simple as it is. Now with enols, it's a little bit more complex because the lone pair on oxygen needs to come down. We're going to attack in the same way as we have above. Only now we get to a protonated species like this because we've still got the hydrogen attached to the oxygen up here. So this is why I've drawn in uh, a biatomic uh, electrophile because something needs to come along and just deprotonate this carbonyl compound to get us to our final product. And you can see the final product is the same in both instances. It's just that one of these is done under basic conditions via an enolate, 
and one's been done under acidic conditions via an enol. So just to summarise, if we take a carbonyl compound and expose it to base, um, if it's a strong base, we can form an enolate irreversibly, or if it's a weaker base, we might form it as a reversible equilibrium mixture. Uh, or if we expose our carbonyl compound to acid, we can form an enol. But both of these, when treated with an electrophile, will give us a product which is functionalized at the alpha position uh, immediately adjacent to where the carbonyl is.